Welcome to Holy Week, the friends and foes of Jesus. I read from Matthew chapter 27, verses 15 through 23. Hear now the word of God. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, let him be crucified. And he said, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. Thus the reading of God's word. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we call upon you and ask you for Holy Spirit that we may glean through your scriptures. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. There are a few people mentioned in the Bible, in the New Testament, whose names are in all four Gospels. Because of the significance of their roles, you know, maybe you can call them to mind. John the Baptist, Mary Magdalene, Peter, Pontius Pilate. But it might surprise you that one name may not have come to mind, and that is Barabbas. Barabbas? Really? I mean, after all, if you think about it, not even the 12 disciples are all named in all four Gospels. Or Jesus' stepdad, Joseph, he's only mentioned in two of the Gospels. So when Barabbas' name is mentioned in all four Gospels, clearly Holy Spirit wants us to uh, take note because we are to learn something from Barabbas. But Barabbas, there's little, little written about him. He's like Melchizedek. He comes on the scene. He has no pedigree. There is no introduction. He suddenly comes on the pages of scripture, then disappears and never mentioned again. So as we glean through what we do have, we want to take a significant note. And just like Melchizedek, Barabbas is an important biblical character. And we're first introduced to Barabbas in Matthew chapter 27, verse 16, where Barabbas' name, first name is uh, mentioned. And in the early Greek manuscripts, they give his proper name as Jesus, Yeshua, and his surname as Barabbas. Now, Bar means son. We have an example of that from Peter when um, he, is, he is named as Simon Bar Jonah. He is the son of Jonah. And when a young Jewish boy is coming into manhood, he is Bar Mitzvah, and he is Bar Mitzvah, a son of the law. So Bar means son, and Abba means father. And in Romans chapter 8, 15, we, we know that from when we read, we cry, Abba, Father. Now, Barabbas literally means son of the father. Now, we might think that as a descriptive uh, uh, name of a mischievous child that like um, we have, we often say, like father, like son, but really, in that setting, it's a cultural title of respect of a father who is prominent, who is important, who is distinguished. And it's especially of a father who is a rabbi. So it is a common surname in, a, in the rabbinical class. Son of the father is 
saying, well, he's the rabbi's son. But Matthew gives us a description of Barabbas. He is said to be notorious. Now, that's just, that means that he has a reputation, but not just a reputation, he has a bad reputation. He is infamous. infamous. He is well known for his crimes. The other gospel lay out those crimes. In, Luke, in uh, Mark and Luke, we find that he's in prison for insurrection and murder. And John has him uh, listed as a thief or a robber. Now, as a robber, that was no common um, thief, no petty criminal. It was not like Judas who was pulling from the disciples' purse secretly. No, John uses a much stronger word. He uses a word that means extortionist, a pillager, a looter, a robber who would openly and violently take what he wanted. He's a marauding outlaw. And that, that same word is used in the parable of the Good Samaritan, where Jesus uses it for the robber who strips the man of his clothing, beats him mercilessly, into, uh, um, and leaves him callously on the road. Also, the petty thieves, uh, these are no petty thieves. And when, when John talks of the thieves on the cross, he uses this same word. They were probably a part of Barabbas' violent gang. But we do have robber used as in the word for insurrectionist. But I would think that Barabbas' was no, no patriotic freedom fighter. No. He was more a self-seeking, opportunistic thug who used the insurrection for his own purposes. His infamy preceded him. Well, Matthew also calls Barabbas a prisoner. Now, there are two reasons to be a prisoner. One, you're awaiting judgment, or you're awaiting execution. So Barabbas was a brutal, cutthroat criminal. He was judged guilty and condemned to die. And on the morning of Jesus' trial, three executions were scheduled. Barabbas and his two confederates. So, while um, perhaps he was a noble person at one time, but clearly he was not one now. But, Jesus is, um, stands in, dark, in, 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 in stark contrast to Jesus Barabbas. Jesus Barabbas is in prison, condemned to, to execution. But Jesus of Nazareth was declared innocent by Pilate. And, no, and not just once. In Luke chapter 23, verse 3, we read, then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. In verse 15, Behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Verse 16, Nothing deserving death has been done by him. Verse 22, What evil has he done? I have found in him no guilt deserving death. Three times, at least three times, Pilate declares Jesus not guilty. Three witnesses in the gospel narratives. Pilate himself, Herod, who released Jesus back to, Her uh, back to Pilate, and Pilate's own wife testified to his virtue. So when Pilate offers Jesus up to the crowd, he was confident that given the choice between the heinous Barabbas and the virtuous Jesus, Jesus would be released. So in verse 17 of Matthew chapter 27, we read Pilate asking a very important question, probably one of the more important questions throughout the Bible. Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas 
or Jesus, who is called Christ. In essence, Pilate was presenting to them, who should I release? The life taker or the life giver? The murderer or the Messiah? The insurrectionist or the innocent? Well, we know their choice. Why was there, why would they choose him? Because Barabbas was like them. In Romans chapter 1, verse 32, we read this verse. Although they knew the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only did the same, but also appro approved of those who practiced them. See, they chose Barabbas because he was like them and those who, who uh, condemned Jesus. They showed the same things as Pilate's pragmatic, self-serving unbelief. They showed the religious leaders envy and scorn. And their fickleness cried, Hosanna on Sunday and crucify on Friday. So they, they, they liked Jesus's, Jesus when he healed the sick and he raised the dead and, and fed them literally and spiritually. But darkness hates light because it exposes their deeds. So no matter what heinous crimes Barabbas might commit later, they wouldn't demolish Israel's corrupt culture the way Jesus would. See, there's nothing more destructive to the plans of a world to advance sin and crime than a Christ who freely speaking as he wills. And Jesus will speak as he will. Death itself could not stop him, nor could any power under heaven. But Pilate asked a seminal question. He, don't, he didn't ask it just to his audience, but he asks, asks it to us also. See, somehow as we as Christians might look at these narratives and some be somehow removed from them and ask even the question, how could they choose Barabbas, Barabbas over Jesus? But in reality, we choose an alternative to Jesus every day in our unhealthy relationships, our taking away from our Bible reading or prayer. We covet time, money, and authority for ourselves rather than for the kingdom. We do it all under the veneer of respectability or even religion. But we even may sometimes look down on notorious sinners, those who are reckless in their sin and open, and they, they, they don't have a mask to cover it up. They seem to be the most helpless of all sinners, but in reality, they are the ones to whom the gospel promises the most. We read in Luke chapter 7 of the, of the sinful woman who anointed Jesus' feet with her tears and her kisses and wiped those feet with her hair. See, when we are forgiven much, we love much. And Jesus died in the place for sinners like Barabbas like me. Well, Barabbas is significant to us because he's the embodiment of a helpless, hopeless sinner who is spared from condemnation. He's given an, an undeserved place of privilege just because Jesus took his place on the cross. And Barabbas to us is a flesh and blood symbol of every redeemed sinner. In a true and literal sense, he could actually say, Christ died for my sins. And he may have been the first one to confess that. So though in the dark hours of the crucifixion, when the disciples were confused and scattered and those closest to Jesus were grasping for meeting, Barabbas was already fully aware that Jesus was dying in his place. 
Now, I'm not suggesting that he knew fully the conviction of saving faith, but, but he did definitely have a crude understanding of the principle which at the heart of the atonement. Christ had taken his place on the cross in a literal and physical sense, bore the condemnation due Barabbas, made it possible for Barabbas to be set free by no work or merit on Barabbas' part. He did not deserve the favor that was shown him. So Barabbas to a, typifies and illustrates the central principle of the gospel. And I think J.C. Ryle, in his commentary to John, captures it well. Where he writes, Here is an illustration of the great Christian doctrine of substitution. Barabbas, the real criminal, is acquitted and let go free. Jesus, innocent and guiltless, is condemned and sentenced to death. So is it in the salvation of our souls. We are all by nature like Barabbas and deserving God's wrath and condemnation. Yet he was acquitted righteous and set free. The Lord Jesus Christ is perfectly innocent, and yet he is counted a sinner, punished as a sinner, and put to death that we may live. Christ suffers, though guiltless, that he may be pardoned. We are pardoned, though guilty, because of what Christ die, does for us. We are sinners and yet counted righteous. Christ is righteous and yet counted a sinner. Happy is that man who understands this doctrine and has laid hold of it by faith for the salvation of his soul. And Paul, speaking of Jesus, writes in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake he was made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. May the joy of the Lord be with you. God bless.